everybody. Welcome to week 13 of PS231. So we're officially to the final topic, capital F, capital T, of the class. I know it's hard to believe, but we've made it. So in the previous few lectures, we've discussed the role that private information or asymmetric information can play in a variety of strategic contexts. Um, so the basic idea is that there are certain things that a given player knows about themselves or their utility functions or something like that. And that has some bearing on the way that the uninformed actors uh, have to respond. It also means that there's an additional responsibility on the informed player's side because they will choose a different action for every one of their types, which means that we need to think about deviation and strategy a little bit differently. And it means that we also need to think through the expected utility calculations that uninformed players have to make in anticipation of trying to find some best response for, relative to the informed player. In the lectures prior to that, we talked about the role of time, right? So we talked about extensive form games where some of the moves precede some of the other moves. We talked about subgame perfect equilibrium and sort of the role that the shadow of the future can play in what is the best decision to make today. And up to this point, there's, there's been models with time in them and models with information in them. And so our final topic will be extensive form games of incomplete information, where both pl some players know things that other players don't, and some players make moves prior to other players' moves. This is a very rich area in applied game theory, so perfect Bayesian equilibrium, the, the equilibrium concept I'll be talking about for the last few weeks of the class, is sort of where most people that do applied game theoretic work in political science, that, that's probably the most common way about conducting an analysis. This should be of some help to you as you read papers and some of your other classes because you'll see perfect Bayesian equilibrium or extensive form games of incomplete information again and again and again. It's also super fun. Um, so the analysis will shift a little bit to where we're sort of like detectives trying to see if equilibria with certain properties exist. So with perfect Bayesian equilibrium in models like the ones I'll be showing you today, oftentimes there are many, many, many equilibria. And consequently, we are generally less concerned with characterizing all of the equilibria of an extensive form game of incomplete information. And we are more concerned with checking to see whether a particular state of affairs is supportable in equilibrium. Is it possible for a certain combination of choices to be stable, in a sense? Now, because we have three weeks to discuss this topic, I think it would be especially useful today to talk about maybe the simplest possible model that I could draw up that introduces the concept and study it very thoroughly, very methodically, sort of work our way through all of the possibilities in this simplest possible extensive form game of incomplete information. And so we'll move on to politics in the final two weeks, but, but today I actually just want to talk about poker. Yes, poker, the, the card game, poker. No, don't, don't, don't get rid of the video yet. I mean, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to make so much money going to Vegas once Vegas is a thing again. No, you're not. Please do not think that I just promised that you're going to make money. Uh, I need to hire some lawyers for all sorts of disclaimers. No, 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 no. However, you will see that a lot of the interesting nuances of incomplete information game theory with extensive form, time plus information, poker is actually a really good way to get introduced to that concept, even if it's only a stylized way for us to get our feet wet. So I actually just want to design the entire lecture around this one model, and then we'll work our way through it. So let's get started. So in the A block, I want to introduce our very simple model of poker. The basic idea here is that you're going to have information about how good your card is. It's going to be two card poker. It's going to be the world's most boring poker game. And yet it'll be hard enough to get you into a bit of a flop sweat by the end of the lecture. Getting the simple things right is hard sometimes. So the basic idea is that you're going to have a card and you're going to know if it's good or not. And you're going to decide whether or not to, to raise, to, to, to put more money into the pot or to just stay and accept the outcome as it sits. I then see your choice. I see whether or not you raised, and consequently, I get to update my beliefs about how good your card is. So if you raise, if you bet more, I will be able to interpret that, potentially, as a way to learn of how good I think your card is, and thus whether or not I want to match your bet, call, or get out of the game myself, fold. 
So this super simple version of poker is going to be more than enough for us to introduce all of the rudiments and then some of an extensive form game uh, of incomplete information. While we're there, we will also discuss what is the sequentially rational thing for me to do, the uninformed player, the receiver of the signal, what is the best thing for me to do, uh, conditional on my beliefs about your card. In the B block, I want to talk about the possibility of separating equilibria in our simple poker game. So a separating strategy is one where of the version of you that has a good card plays one way, and the version of you that has a bad card plays a completely different way. So a separating equilibrium is sort of what happens if somebody tells the truth. One type of you does one thing, another type of you does another thing, and so I'm able to draw perfect inferences about which type you are based only on your actions. So you, you'll see what all this means in a moment, but the basic idea of a separating strategy or a potentially a separating equilibrium is it's one where signals are informative messages. So in a separating strategy, I, the receiver of the signal, will be able to draw an inference perfectly about what type you are, what kind of cards you have, which in the world of poker isn't so great, but in some other situations is pretty good, right? Sometimes you want signals to have bite, other times you don't want signals to have bite. So we'll discuss the possibility of separating equilibria, we will consider all of the possible separating strategies, and it'll be a good way for us to start poking at this simple poker model, uh, which, simple as it is, will still be somewhat intimidating. In the C block, I want to discuss the possibility of pooling equilibria. A pooling strategy is one where every type does the same thing. So if the person, if the version of you that has a good card raises, they put more money in the pot, and the version of you that has a bad card also raises, they put more money into the pot. That's what we would call pooling on raising, because both types of you did the same thing. Whereas in separating strategies, or potentially separating equilibria, we were able to draw perfect inferences based on the signal, that is, the messages were fully informative. In pooling equilibria, the exact opposite is true. There's so much noise baked into the signal that I won't be able to learn anything from your behavior. That, consequently, will shift my incentives about whether to fold or call, depending on what I see you do. Hopefully the wheels are already starting to turn. And then, don't, just be cool, just be cool, please be cool. Will you be cool just for a second? Just be cool for a second. I, just trust me, will you trust me? Just trust me. In the D block, we'll talk about a potential for mixing. Now, I know that this seems like a very bad reason to introduce the possibility of a whole extra block. This lecture is not gonna be too long one way or the other. This is just my way of making sure that there's a timestamp for the mixing equilibrium. Now think about what mixing is in the context of poker. Let's say that you're the low type, and sometimes you raise, and sometimes you don't. That sounds an awful lot like bluffing to me. Doesn't that sound like bluffing to you, where, you know, depending on the toss of some coin, you either raise or you don't, even though you have a bad card. You try to mimic the version of you that has a good card. Don't, just be cool. It's gonna be fine. You're gonna learn so much today, it's gonna be great. And by the end, you'll be better at dinner parties, you'll be better at poker night. Basically, I've got your entire social week covered here, right? So that's the best thing about all of PS231. That said, we've got four blocks to get through, so I, sh I better shut up right now. Let's get started. All right, so here in the A block, I want us to work through a simple, stylized version of poker. It's going to be the world's simplest poker game, and it goes like this. So, poker is one of those games where you have to ante up. You have to have money in the pot to get started. So, in order for the poker game to begin, you and I will both put one dollar into the pot. Okay, so we both have a dollar in the pot. That's the central pool of money. I don't know if you've played poker before. And here's the version of the poker game that we're gonna play. I'm gonna give you a card. Here's your card. I didn't see it. I'm gonna give me a card. Okay. I'll tell you what my card is. My card is a queen. And this is just randomly. I just did this randomly, but here's my card. I don't know how well you can see. Yeah, there's my card. Okay. And here's your card. And I don't know what it is. I didn't look. So I know that I've got this Queen of Hearts, I've got the Queen of Hearts, and I don't know what card you have. And I genuinely don't know what card you have. Now the basic idea is, 
you're going to know whether you have a good card or a bad card and I'm not. Right now there's private information, you have private information and I don't. Literally, you know something I don't know right now. You know what's on this card and I don't. We both know that I've got a queen. Now, queen, I'm thinking this is pretty good. I'm thinking this is pretty good, all right? So I, f I feel like this is a really good card. So now, what's gonna happen is you are going to have an opportunity to make a bet. You can either put another dollar into the pot, you can put another dollar into the pot, you can raise, or you can stay. You can say, you know what, this is good enough, let's just check to see who has a higher card, all right? So if you stay, then that's the end of the game, and whichever of us has the higher card wins the two dollars that's in the pot. That'll be a one for you and a minus one for me. Or if you raise, either I fold and you get the whole pot, or I call and now there's more money in the pot, and then we check to see. So conditional on, so here's my, this is my queen of hearts, and this is your card. I really don't know what it is. I don't know what this card is, okay? Now I'm thinking to myself, well, chances are good that you don't have a card better than this. That's what I'm thinking right now. I'm thinking this is a very good card. Queen is a really good card. So I'm thinking to myself, the odds that you have, I mean, I know what the probability is. The probability that you have a card better than this is the probability that you have a king plus the probability that you have an ace, right? So there are four kings and four aces out of the 51 cards that aren't this one. So the probability that you have a better card than I do, based on what I already know, and you know too, the probability that you have a better card is 8 out of 51. 8 out of 51. Which is, that's what calculators are for. It's like 15.6%. 15.7%. In that neighborhood. Okay? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking chances are good. Chances are very good. Okay. So so, so what, what choice would you make about this? Because remember, I don't know. Do you want to raise or do you want to call? Uh, stay. We'll work through both. Suppose Because I don't know. So suppose that you wanted to stay. Suppose that you wanted to stay. So th then we would be done with the interaction. We'd be done with the interaction. And we would just check to see who has the higher card. And whoever has the higher card gets both of the dollars. If you raise, if you raise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to call, I'm going to call. I'm not going to fold because I, I don't think that you have a card better than the queen probably. That's what I think. That's, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. So if you stayed, then that's the end of it. And if you raise, then I call. Okay. And then either way, we'll look at the card. Well, let's just, either way, let's see what you had. You had a king, you jerk. Why didn't you tell me? Why did you not tell me that you have a king? You should have told me that. That's just bad play. Why did you do that? You de I deserve better than that. I'm trying to be really nice. We're trying to do cool stuff. And you didn't even have the courtesy to tell me that you had a king. So you win. All right. That's the whole game. The whole game is we each get a card. You observe your card. You either uh, stay or raise. I observe if you raise and I have a chance to fold or call. Okay. That's how this is gonna go. So let's talk about how to encode the game of poker. I still can't believe you didn't tell me. That's, that's such a jerk move. That's such a jerk move. You should have emailed me. You should have you should have posted something on Piazza that said, "Hey, Rob, you're walking into a big problem here. You don't know you're going to be caught unawares." You know, such is the life of a poker player. That's just what happens. All right. So, there's a kind of node that we haven't discussed so far in our extensive form games that's going to be worth introducing now, okay? Um and it's called a, a random node, a stochastic node. And the idea is is a node that isn't controlled by any player, but it isn't a terminal node, okay? So at the beginning of time in this interaction, nature makes a move. Nature is our way of talking about the, the person that tosses coins. No, nature is our source of randomness that lives outside of the model. Okay, so, so there's all sorts of things that are random. Okay, like the cards and how they're distributed. I still can't believe you didn't tell me.
So at the beginning of time, nature makes a move. So nature determines the card that you have just the same way that when I shuffled, I determined the card that you had. Okay? Sh my shuffling of the cards was nature. I had nature in my hands. That's weird, right? And let's say that the prior probability, my belief that you have a high card and also how often nature generates a high card, let's say that the probability that you have a high card, let's say that that's alpha. So alpha percent of the time with probability alpha, you have a high card. And with probability 1 minus alpha, you have a low card. And the idea here is that high just means high enough to beat player 2, and low means low enough to lose to player 2, and we're going to... Ties aren't going to count in this game. Okay. We don't have a dealer to, like, cut up the pot. That's no fun. So you either have a high card or a low card. Basically, nature chooses the state of the world. Are we in this state of the world, or are we in this state of the world? And you get to know. You're going to observe. So after nature's choice if you want to call it a choice. Player one, that's you, gets to make a decision. So player one observes what type they are. They know what type they are. They see their card. You saw that king, you jerk, and you didn't tell me. Okay? So, so, you, so player one sees their card. This is the whole point, is that nature makes a decision, quote unquote, that player one gets to observe. They get to see their card. They know the state of the world. And they have one of two choices, irrespective of their, of their type. Player one can either stay, in which case we go to a terminal node. That's the end of time. So if you stay, then that's the end of betting, and we're going to turn over the cards and see who has a better card. Alternatively, player one can raise. And this is where the real action is going to be. Notice, that, again, if you stay, that goes to terminal nodes, and we'll talk about the utilities here in a second. Or if you raise, then player two, that's me, gets to make a decision. Now, before we get too far into this, player two does not know the state of the world. I didn't know what card you had. I didn't know you had that king under there that you didn't email me about a week ago. Player two's nodes are linked with this information set, right? So player two does not know which state of the world we're in. That's sort of the whole point of this model. Player two, the receiver of the signal, doesn't get to know the state of the world. The way that we pin down their beliefs is we'll say they believe that the that player one has a high card with probability mu. We'll call that their belief. Their belief is mu. And we'll talk about ways to obtain the belief here in a second. So, at, But mu is just some probability. It is their probability that they think that we're in the state of the world where you, player one, have the high card. And with probability one minus mu, they think that you have the low card, or I think you have the low card. That's my, that's my variable, that's my officially my way of saying, player two doesn't know which state of the world we're in, but they have probabilistic beliefs about that. Regardless, as with any other information set, player two has the same two choices. They can either fold, in which case player one gets the entire pot, or they can call, in which case we'll have to see who has the better card. So there are six possible outcomes, there are six terminal nodes in this game, the two where player one stayed, and then the four possible outcomes depending on um, after player one raised, what player two decides to do. So this is our model of poker. This is our super simple, straightforward model of poker. Okay? Now, real poker, depending on what game you're playing, is way more complicated, but you're going to see that a lot of the key lessons are going to be distillable out of this very simple version of poker. In terms of the preferences, we'll say that if you have the high card, so if you have the high card and you stay, then you get one happiness point and I get minus one happiness point because you won that pot that we both paid into. One dollar of that was yours and one dollar of that was mine, so it's zero sum, one minus one. And if the low type of you stays, then you lose, you get minus one happiness points and I get one happiness point. Now let's go to the situation where you're the high type and you raised. If you're the high type, you have the good card and you raise, let's say that I fold. Well, if I fold, then you get one happiness point and I get minus one because you win, but you don't win the you don't win a bigger pot, you win the same pot. You get one minus one from me. And if I call, that's gonna be your favorite because you have this good card. So so you get two happiness points and I get minus two. You took an extra dollar off of me using this. You, you put more money into the pot, so did I, and you had a good card. 
Now the version of you that has a low card, let's go to the state of the world where you have a low card. If you raise and I fold, then you still get one happiness point and I still get minus one. So, so you won, you managed to use this raising strategy to win what was in the pot. Otherwise you would have lost. However, if I call when you have a low card, if I say, oh yeah, sure, here's some more money, let's see what you got, if I call your bluff, then you lose two happiness points and I gain two happiness points. So throughout this model is zero sum everywhere. It's a, it's a poker game. So this is our nice model of poker. This, this is super simple, straightforward. You could play this version of poker anytime you wanted to. It wouldn't be very exciting. Um, but it's enough for you to learn a lot of important game theoretic concepts. So what I, what I want to do first is I want to talk about what would be sequentially rational for me, player two, to do. Remember, because I've got these two decision nodes that are linked via an information set, I really only make one choice. I either fold or I call. I make one and only one choice. A strategy for me, player two, is one choice made to that one information set. Right? I don't get to, I don't get to condition. I don't get to know what card you have. So the question is, when is it better for me to fold? And when is it better for me to call? And because of the way the utilities line up, that's a function of mu, my belief, my subjective belief, that you have a high card, okay? So we're gonna pin down which mu's, which beliefs, how likely do I think that you have to have the high card to make me wanna fold? How likely do I have to think it is that you have the low card to make me wanna to, to, to call, et cetera? So my expected utility of folding my expected utility of folding, well, with probability mu, you have the high card, and I get minus one happiness points. And with probability one minus mu, you have the low card, I fold it still, I get minus one happiness points. So mu times minus one, plus one minus mu times minus one, that's just minus one. Right? There's no one, the whole point about folding is that it's the certain thing. You can just lose a little bit for sure. So there's my lose a little bit for sure is my minus one. If I fold, no matter what your card is, I lose a dollar. Now, what's my expected utility for calling? Now it depends. So with probability mu, you have the high card. And when I call, that means I lose two dollars minus two happiness points. And with probability one minus mu, you have the low card when I called, now I called your bluff, that's great, I get two happiness points. So mu times minus two, plus one minus mu times two, that works out to two minus four mu. So in other words, my best response, my best response, my, my, my only sequential rational choices, if mu is strictly less than three quarters, then I call for sure. If mu is strictly greater than three quarters, then I, fold for sure. So if I think it's likely you have the high card, I fold. If I think it's likely that you have the low card, I call, right? So this is all pretty straightforward. And that mu exactly equal to the three quarters, I could do either, I could mix, right? That's where I'm indifferent. If mu is exactly equal to three quarters, then my expected utility of folding is minus one, and my expected utility of calling is minus one. I'm indifferent. So I could, I could play either way or I could mix. Regardless, we're gonna pin that down. Let's lock that in. We know for sure that in any equilibrium, that's the only strategy that I, player two, could be playing. If, it, if I think it's very unlikely that you have a, low, uh, a high card, I call. If I think it's very likely that you have a high card, I fold, and at exactly mu equals two thirds, I, I'm indifferent and I could do anything. Now the interesting question is whether or not we're going to be able to find different interesting combinations of your play depending on the card, right? So we have now solved player two's decision nodes, which is just one information set. That is now solved, okay? So now we need to go up and consider what either type of you will do, and we're gonna have to see whether or not the two types of you are complementing one another with their skills. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about the possibility of separating equilibria over in the B block. See you there. Okay, so let's just get our game queued back up. And the question that I have now is, does there exist an equilibrium where the two types of you do different things? Those are called separating strategies, 
right? So a strategy for you is what the high type of you will do and what the low type of you will do, right? Do, the, do we raise, do we stay? Do we raise, do we stay? And the idea here is that what your strategy is, whatever that strategy is, is going to inform my beliefs. That's going to inform my mu. My mu will uh, adjust according to your strategy. And we'll use Bayes' rule for that. So we're gonna get a couple of bites of the apple of Bayes' rule, and you'll see that it's actually not too scary in, in simple models like these. So let's consider first the, the intuitive situation that the version of you that has a high card, the high type, let's suppose that that type raises. That's what I would do. If I had a king, I would have raised. If I was a high card, you would have raised probably. So suppose that the high type raises, and suppose that the low type, the version of you that has a low card, suppose that they stay. This is a separating strategy because the two types of you are doing two different things. You're separating yourselves. You're doing two separate things. What does that mean for my beliefs? What does that mean? Let's say that I knew that. I'm player two. Let's say that I knew that that's what you were doing. What beliefs should I have about the probability that you have a high card? So if I knew that the high type of you was raising and the low type of you was staying, and I saw you raise, what inferences should I draw about your type? Pause the video. What inferences should I be able to draw? What is the mu? What is the correct mu where mu is the probability that you are the high type conditional on the fact that you raised? What is that probability? Pause the video. Pause the video and think it through. You don't need a formula for that. We'll talk about the formula here in a second, but if you pause the video, you'll get the logic down, I think, first. So just pause the video. What is mu? Welcome back to the three of you that pause the video to go get yourself a Red Bull. Mu has to be equal to one. If I knew that the high type was raising all the time and the low type was staying all the time, and then I saw a raise, I would be like, oh yeah, that's the high type, right? I, you don't have to be a very skilled poker player to know that, right? Maybe it'd be better too if like you had a really impish grin on your face while you raised. Yeah, nobody will, everybody will trust that. But let's think that through in terms of Bayes' rule. So let's, let's, let's write out our Bayes' rule formula. So I wanna know the probability, mu is the probability that you are the high type conditional on the fact that you raised. Now remember, Bayes' rule is a fraction thing. So the numerator of the fraction is just my prior belief that you are the high type, that's alpha. So I know that alpha percent of the time you're the high type, so that was my prior belief. Based on what I know about the, the structure of the deck of cards, maybe I know a lot of probability theory, I've counted all 52 cards, I know what's what. So I assign probability alpha that you have the high card, and the probability that you play raise conditional on you being high is given to me by the strategy. So the strategy that we were, the, the separating strategy that we're talking about means that the probability that you raise conditional on being the high type is one, right? You're playing a pure strategy where the high type raises. So our numerator is just alpha times one is alpha. Our denominator, Again, there's alpha times one times alpha, the probability that you're the high type times the probability that you raise conditional on being the high type. And then we also need to add in the probability that you're the low type, which is just one minus alpha, times the probability that you raise conditional on being the low type. Well, in this strategy, you are playing a pure strategy where the low type never raises, so that is zero. So now I've got alpha times one, over alpha times one plus one minus alpha times zero, that's just alpha over alpha is one. So in other words, my belief needs to be one. The only sequentially rational belief for me to have, conditional on the strategy that we're evaluating, conditional on the strategy that the high type is raising and the low type is staying, is one. So my mu, my endogenous belief, was well, one thing that's gonna be really cool here, is that the beliefs have to condition the choices, but the choices also have to condition the beliefs. So information and strategy are gonna come together in this very intimate way now. It's, 
it's it's really cool. That's one of the really cool things about this. And you're like, oh, I'm glad there was something. Well, let's think about, we know if that means that mu is got to be one. Well, we've already established my decision rule based on mu. Player two's decision rule based on mu is if mu is greater than three quarters, I'm going to, I'm going to fold. I'm going to fold for sure. Right? So I fold. So right now at my two decision nodes, which are linked in this one information set, I make one choice and that choice is to fold. So let's lock in the fact that I fold. So right now we have this provisional situation where the high type of you is raised, the low type of you has stayed. Consequently, the mu is equal to one. The one minus mu is equal to zero. And I made the decision therefore to both fold. The final question is, does either type of you have an incentive to deviate? Does the high type suddenly wish that they could stay? Does the low type suddenly wish that they could raise? Right now, the high type of you, I fold, the high type of you gets a, a, a buck, right? You get, you get one happiness point. And if you had stayed out, you get one happiness point. So you don't have a profitable deviation. If you deviated, you'd stay, you get the same exact outcome. However, the low type of you is thinking, oh boy, if I had known that they were going to fold, then I wouldn't sit here and lose for sure. Losing for sure is bad. I would have raised, that would have led to a fold, and I'd get a buck. This is not an equilibrium. There is, there is not a perfect Bayesian equilibrium where the high type raises and the low type stays, because the low type will be wishing that they could have raised too. They'll be like, oh, well, that induced a fold. I wish that I had folded. I wish that I had raised because then I get that buck. Remember, we have to hold player two fixed. Player two then doesn't adjust their beliefs. They don't adjust. We're just saying, conditional on this strategy, does, does anybody want to deviate? Player two doesn't want to deviate. The high type of player one doesn't want to deviate. And the low type does. The low type wishes they could deviate, holding the other two fixed. The high type version of themselves, they got meta and hurry and player two. So this is not an equilibrium. Well, what about the separate equilibrium where this is somewhat paradoxical, the low type raises and the high type stays? Well, what's the appropriate mu then? Before we get to the formula, what's the mu? You can pause it if you want to. What's the uh, correct mu for player two to have? What will, if they knew that the low type was raising all the time, and the high type was staying all the time, what, what probability would they assign to seeing the high type conditional on a raise? Zero. Zero. Right, so they, they, because of these separating strategies, they always get to have a perfect inference. They either go to mu equals one or mu equals zero, right? They went from a probabilistic belief about how good the card was, alpha, and they turned it into a essentially non-probabilistic or at least degenerate belief, zero or one. Separating strategies convey messages perfectly. We go from not quite knowing, alpha is somewhere between zero and one, to knowing for sure whether you have a high card or a low card. Let's just work through the formula to confirm that. So the appropriate way to go through this is the probability that we have a high type conditional on arrays, just like before. Well, that's the probability that it's the high type, that's still alpha. That's exogenous. So throughout this Bayes rule, there'll be three things that don't change, right? The, the, the raw probability of high and low. And then the question is, how do the other three things evolve along with the strategy? So we have alpha times the probability of raising conditional on the high type. Well, in this strategy, that is zero. So now we have zero in the numerator. So long as the dom denominator isn't zero, this is going to be zero. Well, okay, that's over the same thing. That's still just zero. Alpha times zero plus one minus alpha times the probability of raising condition on the low type. Well, that's one in this strategy. So consequently, we, we wind up with, uh, with a mu of zero. Mu equals zero, just as our intuition had told us. Well, we, we know what that means. Because mu is less than three quarters, oh hi Mark, the only sequentially rational thing for player two to do conditional on that new belief is to call. They call, and now what? 
Both types want to deviate. The high type is thinking, I'm stuck up here with one happiness point. If I had known that you were going to call, I'd get two. That would be better. So they want to deviate, which would be enough. But note also that the low type is thinking, what have I done? Now they called, I lost two bucks. If I had stayed, I'd only lose one dollar. So both types of you want to deviate. You are tearing me apart, player two! So that isn't an equilibrium either. In other words, this game of poker does not have a separating equilibrium where messages are perfect, which you didn't need the game to know. If you play any poker, if you do the same thing every time conditional on what card you have, if every time you have a good card, you bet, and every time you have a bad card, you don't bet, then people are going to be able to draw perfect inferences about you. And so consequently, they'll be able, if, if that's what you did, if every time you had a good card, you, you raised, and every time you had a bad card, you folded, then every time that you have a good card, you'll raise and everybody will just fold, and you won't make that much money. That's not a good way to play poker. And then even more paradoxically, if every time you have a good card, you, you stay, and every time you have a bad card, you raise, then you just won't be at the poker table very long. You'll just lose real bad, like in five hands. Don't do that either. Don't do that. So this is our first trip through poker. I wanted to start with this one because it, it kind of gets the thing about the Bayes rule thing, but note also that we've identified an important substantive lesson in zero-sum games of incomplete information with the signaling apparatus the fact that people can draw perfect inferences means that you're not going to see separate equilibria. It's, you, don't, that, you don't see that sort of thing very often. Things that are like poker do not allow for meaningful con conveyance of information through signals. That's a pretty big deal, right? If things are zero-summy, then people aren't going to truthfully reveal their type. They're not going to use their behavior to truthfully reveal themselves. You wouldn't do that. The whole point of poker is you don't want to reveal yourself until it's the end. Otherwise, you just flip your cards over and say, oh, here, would you like to see my cards? And then that would be over. So we don't have any separating equilibria. Over in the C block, we're going to check to see if we have any pooling equilibria. I'll see you there. Okay, so we, we have this cool game. We've learned the cool lesson that we're not going to get into equilibria where people truthfully reveal themselves. All you had to do was watch any poker on ESPN and you would have known that. So in contrast with separating strategies where our two players do different things to truthfully reveal themselves, let's now study a pooling strategy where the different players do the same thing, right? So, so in poker or in lots of other facets of life, if you don't have a good card, that doesn't mean you don't act like you do. You might try to mimic somebody that has a good card in the name of getting some of the benefits that good cards confer, right? So the interesting question here is, in our model of poker as we've drawn it, which has no separating equilibria, does there exist an equilibrium where the high type, the person with the high card raises, and the person with the low card raises? They pool on raising. There's a pooling strategy on raising. Both types raise. They do the same thing. Both types do the same thing. That's pretty interesting. Okay. And you're like, oh boy, interesting is a strong word. Shut up. So does there exist an equilibrium where both types raise? Let's think about that. Now, the interesting question is, what does that do to mu? You know, so before, if I knew which type was doing what for sure then I could just set my beliefs to zero or one. It got really crispy. It got very straightforward. I'm not sure what crispy has to do with that, but it still seems right to me in my mind. So let's work out mu. Let's work out mu, which again we'll get via Bay's rule. Do you have a guess this time? What's your guess? Here's another pause the video moment. So suppose that we were playing a pooling strategy. Suppose that you were pooling. What is the correct belief for me to have? What is the rational belief for me to have that you're the high type conditional on having raised. Pause the video. Here's a hint, it is neither zero nor one. It is neither zero nor one. Oh.
I'm really sorry to do this to you, but I just found out that Al Trebek died. Just please forgive me if the quality of the lecture decreases after this. I'm really sorry. I'm going to try my best. Um, Alex Direct meant a lot to me. And there's a chance that I might not make a whole lot of sense the rest of the lecture. And I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm just sorry if my energy level is bad. So let's get that mu pinned down properly. So we want to know, what is the probability that you're the high type conditional on the fact that you raised? Where both of you are raising now. Okay, so, well, let's think about Bayes' rule. So the numerator is the probability that you're the high type. That's still just alpha. That isn't going to change. Okay. Times the probability that you're raising conditional on being the high type. Well, that's one right now. You're playing a pure strategy. I think we're safe with these back on now. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for all of the... I had a really good ugly cry. Like, full-on Les Mis cry. It's already bad enough to have to look at me for an hour and a half every week, right? And you're like, oh, you forgot the meetings. It's actually three hours. Oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry. And then and the denominator, well, it's the same thing. The probability that you're the high type is alpha times the probability that you raise conditional on being the high type. That's just one. So it's alpha over alpha plus... Well, the probability that you're the low type is one minus alpha. And the probability that the low type raises in this pool on raise strategy is one. So we wind up with alpha times one over alpha times one plus one minus alpha times one, which is just alpha over alpha plus one minus alpha, which is alpha over one, which is alpha. The signal had no meaning. It was a meaningless signal, right? So I didn't learn anything. Time was... When you were playing separating strategies, if you separated, I went from alpha somewhere between zero and one, I don't quite know which type you are, to I got to go to zero or one, I got to know your type perfectly. But here, I don't get to know that. Now, I still have alpha. I learned nothing from the signal because both types of you are doing the same thing. This is a completely uninformative signal. Okay? Sorry, there's going to be a lot of this now. So, so with, with pooling strategies, we get meaningless signals and the priors go through. My, my posterior belief is exactly the same as my prior belief. I gain nothing from your signal. The question now becomes, should I fold or should I call? Well, that depends on alpha, right? So if I think that you have a low card, if I think alpha is low, in particular, if alpha is strictly less than, than three quarters, then I'll call. I call then. Now let's think about the two types of you and what they would like to do. The high type of you is very happy that I called, right? They're like, oh, great. Now I get two happiness points. So the high type is, is perfectly happy. They don't want to deviate. However, the low type just had their bet called. They thought, well, I'm going to mimic the high type. And because alpha was low, I called the low type's bluff, right? 
I called the low types bluff, and next thing you know, they just had their bet, they just had their bluff called, and they lost two happiness points. Had they deviated, they would they would get minus one, which is better. So the low type wishes that they had deviated. So this is not an equilibrium either. So if alpha is strictly less than three quarters then there does not exist a pooling equilibrium where both types raise. However, if alpha is greater than or equal to three quarters, then I, player two, have no choice but to fold. I think it's likely enough that you have a high card that I don't want to get involved. So I fold, I take my medicine, minus one happiness points for me, that's fine. The high type of you is happy, they get one happiness point, if they deviated they get one happiness point. No profitable deviation. And the low type of you is happy. They get one happiness point now. Had they deviated, they get minus one. So that's worse. So, so this is a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Now, what are all the elements of the equilibrium? What things would you have to write down if you had to write down the equilibrium? Well, we need four things in this particular model. One and two are what does each type of you do? The high type raises, the low type raises. So we have a strategy for each type of player one. We have a belief that taps into that strategy. So we have mu equals alpha. That is the only sequentially rational belief to have. That is the Bayes rule belief. So that alpha matches with the strategy that we've just described. So the strategies help determine the mu, the belief. And then we finally need a choice on my part that is consistent with that belief. And in this case, I fold. So we have found our first First perfect Bayesian equilibrium, and you can see why this is, a, in many respects, the punchline for the, for the class. The information has to match with the strategies, and the strategies have to match with the information. What you do, the two types of you, has to be consistent. My beliefs have to be consistent with that. Then my choices have to be consistent with my beliefs. And then the ori original choices that you made have to be consistent with my choices. It's reasonable now to wonder, does there exist an equilibrium where both types pool on staying? Now there's no Bayes rule to work with here, because we never hit this information set. We'd have to divide by zero, right? But let's just think this through without any formulas. As it sits, if, we, if, both, types, if the both types pool on staying rather than raising, notice that that gets the high type one happiness point. And... The only reason that they would not want to deviate from this situation is if player two was folding for sure, right? Otherwise, if player two was placing any probability on calling, tiny as it might be, that would make the high type want to raise. So the only way that the high type would not want to deviate from pool on, on stay is if for sure player two was folding. That's an off-path belief driving a strategy. We'll talk about that a lot in the next two weeks. So exactly the thing that makes the high type want to stay, the fact that the, the player two is going to fold for sure, actually that creates a problem then because the low type is thinking, well, I'm getting minus one for, for losing when I stay. If I knew for sure they were going to fold, then I would have raised. So there is no equilibrium where they pool on staying. However, we have found our first equilibrium, which emerges only some of the time, so if alpha is greater than or equal to three quarters, we have found a pooling equilibrium where both types raise. In particular, the low type takes advantage of the fact that most of the time we have a high card, and then they, they mimic, they act as if they have a high card too, and that's a credible thing for them to do because chances are good that there is a high card, even though they actually don't have one. So those are our pooling, that's our pooling analysis. Right? We talked about separating, we talked about pooling, those are the usual kinds. But over in the, in the D block, I want to give you a little bit of bonus content by talking about the nature of bluffing. So I'll see you over there. So here in the D block, I want to talk about a relatively esoteric equilibrium in this game of poker. So what's interesting about poker, or other games of this type, is that people don't do the same thing every time, right? So up to this point, we've considered all of the pure strategy possibilities. We've said, well, what happens if the high type raises for sure and the low type stays for sure? What happens if it's flipped? What happens if they both do one thing for sure? 
these have all been pure strategies, right? Everybody's always choosing the same thing. However, if you, you know, one interesting thing about poker is you don't bluff every time. If you have a bad card, maybe you bluff sometimes. You might mix, right? Sometimes you raise and sometimes you stay. An interesting question is, what is the origin of that mixing probability? Where does that come from, if at all? And what ramifications does that subtle decision on your part have on how the entire game plays out? So let's look for a, a final kind of equilibrium. We're gonna try to find an equilibrium where the high type of you raises for sure, which is the, the most sensible thing, that's weakly dominant. So raising always does at least as well as staying, and sometimes it's strictly better. So let's suppose, let's, let's pin that down. We know for sure that the high type will raise. So suppose that the high type is raising for sure, but suppose that the low type, the type of you as a low card, mixes. We want to try to find out, uh, maybe there's an equilibrium where they mix. That would be interesting, right? That would make things really interesting. Because that would mean that the low type is trying to take advantage of the fact that the, the player two doesn't really know. But notice something. If the low type stays, they get minus one for sure, right? Because they lose. However, if they raise, some of the time they could get a one, and some of the time they get a minus two, neither of which is exactly equal to minus one. So none of the outcomes if they raise are equal to the outcome where they stay, which means that the only reason they would be willing to mix is if they were indifferent over these two options. But the only way that they could be indifferent over these two options is if player two was mixing as well. If player two was playing a pure strategy of fold, then player two wouldn't want to mix. They would just want to raise. And if player two was playing a pure strategy of call, then the low type wouldn't want to mix. They would just want to stay. The only way that the low type would want to mix is if player two also wanted to mix. Okay. And in particular, player two has to mix with a very particular probability. What probability is that? Well, let's say that the probability that player two folds, let's call that Q. Let's say that the probability that player two folds is Q. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to find out what that is in a second, but right now we have to find out what the Q, what, what this has to be in, to, in order to render the low type indifferent enough to want to mix. We need Q times that one happiness point that you get when they fold, plus, 1 minus Q times that minus 2 happiness points that you get when they call, that has to be equal to the minus 1 that you get if you stay. In other words, Q has to be the expected utility that makes the low type indifferent between staying and getting minus 1 and raising and getting some mix of 1 and minus 2. That mix has to be just right. That mix has to be just right. Well, you work all that out, that means that player 2's mixing probability must be equals Q equals 1 third. Q has to be equal 1 third. But if Q equals one third, if player two is folding a third of the time and calling two thirds of the time, now, now we have player two indifferent and thus they are willing to mix, okay? But we don't know with which probability yet. However, notice that player two, player two is only gonna be willing to mix if they're indifferent between folding and calling. Player two doesn't want to mix unless they're indifferent. When would they be indifferent between folding and calling? Remember that folding gets them minus one for sure. Calling gets them minus two with probability mu and two with probability one minus mu. So when would they be indifferent? Well, that depends on mu. In particular, we need mu to be exactly equal to three quarters. If mu is exactly equal to three quarters, and we said that that was the world that allowed player two to mix. So a necessary condition for player two being willing to mix, which is itself a necessary condition for player one being willing to mix, is that mu is exactly equal to three quarters. So as of right now, the high type is raising for sure. The low type is mixing with some probability P that we don't know yet. Player two is mixing at where they fold a third of the time. And now we need to find out what that mixing probability is. How are we gonna get that? 
How are we going to find out the mixing probability? This is the final pause the video moment of today. How are we going to find the low types mixing probability P? What device can we use to find the low types mixing probability P conditional on everything that we've set up to this point? Pause the video. Welcome back to those few of you that just went and poured one out for Alex Trebek. Bayes rule. We're going to use our Bayes rule formula. We have everything that we need actually. Okay. So, so notice that we need mu to be equal to three quarters. So we need it to be the case that that thing that we solved to get, we need that to come out three quarters. So let's work out that formula. What is the probability that we have the high type conditional on seeing a raise? Well, with probability alpha, we're up against the high type and we need the probability of raising conditional on it being the high type. Well, we fixed that first. We said the high type is raising for sure. So that is one. So it's alpha times one, just like before. Over alpha times one, just like before. Uh, the probability of having the high type times the probability of raising conditional on being the high type, that's alpha times one. Plus the probability of being the low type, that's one minus alpha, times the probability of raising conditional on being the low type. That is P, that's what we're looking for. We're trying to find that. We wanna know what's the probability that the low type raises. We wanna find that. We want to find that. We have everything we need. Alpha over alpha plus one minus alpha times P has got to be equal to three quarters. Otherwise player two wouldn't be willing to mix, which in turn means that the low type of player one wouldn't have been willing to mix, which is what we're looking for. So that's what we need. We need this all to come together in just, just the right way. Which P, which probability of raising conditional on being the low type does that? Now, we, now it's just a matter of some algebra. Algebra, 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 algebra. In my mind, that's a song, even though it isn't even a good poem. We solve for P and we find out that P has got to be equal to alpha over three times one minus alpha. So in other words, you mix more when there's more, you, you, you bluff more often when there are more high cards to play with, right? If alpha is high, if you think the opponent thinks it's likely you have a high card, then you bluff more often. And, and vice versa. Notice that this mixing probability that we just found is guaranteed to be strictly greater than zero because alpha is strictly greater than zero. Everything in this is strictly greater than zero, so that all turns out just fine. So our mixing, the probability of, of raising is strictly greater than zero. And it's strictly less than one, so long as alpha is strictly less than three quarters. So a necessary condition for an equilibrium of this type is that alpha is strictly less than three quarters. If alpha is greater than or equal to three quarters, then we just play that pooling equilibrium that we found over in the C block. And if it's less, then that allows for this possibility, this, this weird mixing possibility, where now the high type is always doing what's best for them and the low type is bluffing. The low type is bluffing. That's officially bluffing. So how would we write down this equilibrium? Well, we would say the high type uh, raises with probability one and stays with probability zero. The low type raises with probability alpha over two times one minus alpha and stays with probability one minus that. The belief mu is exactly equal to three quarters and the high type folds with probability one third and calls with probability two thirds. Now everybody is best responding to everybody else the beliefs are consistent with the mixing. It all has come together in this beautiful, perfect Bayesian equilibrium that really, if you ask me, pins down all of the intrigue of poker. The rest is details. The rest is details. Now, they're important and interesting details, but, but none of them is more foundational to the essence of poker than this equilibrium. So that concludes our first and final D block. I hope you enjoyed it. So what did we talk about today? Well, we talked about poker. You're like, well, what is that good? What good does that do me? Well, for starters, um, poker is itself an interesting game and has been related to many important uh, states of affairs in politics. So no less an authority on international relations than the great military theorist Karl von Clausewitz famously compared war 
to a game of cards, and in particular, he meant poker. How do we properly take advantage of the information that we have? Or how do we properly take advantage of the fact that our opponent doesn't have the information that we do? Right? So if we're the low type, if we have a low card, or if we have a small army with low morale, does that mean that we can we can't act as if we have a big army or good morale? No, it depends on how everything comes together. How much stronger is the strong type than you? How much weaker are you as the weak type? What are what's the what's your enemy's prior beliefs about how strong you are? What would you have done if you were strong? So so the low type in our poker game has to make just as many difficult decisions as the leader of a foundering army does. We also talked about signaling more generally. You may not realize it, but the simple act of making a bet in poker sends a signal. It, it conveys information, potentially, about what type of cards you have, right? So what's interesting about signaling is it brings together time and information. Now, we talked about incomplete information game theory in a simultaneous sense the last two weeks. Um, but with sequential... Time allows for learning. Time allows for messaging. Time allows for signaling. Where I know something you don't, I do something that you don't know if it represents the information that I have, you then draw an inference, then and only then do you make a decision. Ostensibly, when somebody uses a turn signal, they are supposed to use that before they make a move. Right? A, a turn signal is supposed to come first, I have private information that I would like to turn. You don't know that I'd like to turn. You're in some other car. We don't even know each other, right? So I use my turn signal. That'll, that provides information to other drivers who then update their beliefs about my intentions as a driver. By the way, yes, I'm miserable to drive with. And then make their decisions accordingly. If you don't allow time before your turn signal, then you might as well have not used the turn signal, which is something that I've said in slightly more colorful language all over Champaign-Urbana since I moved here. However, it's with a richer version of poker in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. It's very tempting to look at this simple stylized version of poker that we talked about today and say, ah, this is still way too simple. You know, ordinarily poker players have five cards or seven cards or nine cards, not, not one. And ordinarily there's many different rounds of betting. And most importantly, not only do I not know your card, you don't know my cards either. And those are all true. So the model that we talked about today, while ostensibly a model of poker, while obviously a model of some interaction very similar to poker, was not a model of any kind of poker game that gets played in any of the casinos that one might frequent. Does that mean that this wasn't a useful model of poker? No. We didn't get all of the details of poker right, but that wasn't our goal. The goal was to just pin down some of the most essential features. And games like this, these extensive form games of incomplete information, simpler is better for lots of reasons, uh, but one of those reasons is it gives you more of an opportunity to be an active analyst. So we took this super simple game that we wrote down and we poked at it from a lot of different angles, right? We said, well, let's check for the separating equilibria. Let's check for the pooling equilibria. Let's check for the semi-separating, some mixing equilibrium. Let, let's look at this from all the different angles. We squeezed it very hard. And even then, even our super simple analysis, this was a little bit nuanced. This was a little bit cumbersome in parts, right? A lot of different moving parts had to go together just right. Well, not At, just if we right. had written down a model with two-sided and complete information, like our trade war from last week, then I would still be talking, right? So the analysis would have taken hours and hours and hours. The subsequent analysis may have provided you with deep insights that are relevant for an actual game of poker that you played, but those results also would have been so big and so cumbersome that you wouldn't have been able to make much sense of them, whereas the results that we have, inapplicable as they may be for any given real model of poker, are simple and straightforward. So the question becomes, when we write down a model like this, particularly one that lends itself to having many equilibria, would we rather get one kind of poker just right? Or would we rather equip you with simple lessons that arise from a simple stylized model of poker that never gets played in the hopes that you, somebody sophisticated, will then be able to apply those lessons to any game of poker that you find yourself in? There isn't a right answer to that, right? 
We, we want the model to be rich enough that we learn something from it, but simple enough that the thing that we learn is something that we can make some sense of. We're now officially at the part where the, the answers could be too complex. I know that's hard to believe, but we are now at the point where the, the equilibria of a model that we write down may be too complicated for us to be able to interpret them meaningfully. It's natural then to try to draw parallels with the, the empirical reality, the data reality that we find around us. Any of you that have taken a statistics class or an econometrics class or a political methods class know that we like to use statistics to try to learn important lessons about political processes. The models that we use to generate those results, the statistical models that we use, come in one of two flavors in very broad brushstrokes. Simple ones that we can interpret their results quite easily, and complicated ones that we can interpret their results very easily. With simple models, like you may have seen in some of your other classes, regression, logistic regression, and so on, it's very easy to pin down what the effect of one variable is on another variable. What is the effect of some x on some y? What is the effect of an independent variable on the dependent variable? In a simple, interpretable way. However, models like those typically do not do a very good job of characterizing the entire data generating process. You wouldn't want to use a model like that to predict something very important to you. If you had to play the stock market or decide what the appropriate treatment was for somebody that you loved very much, then you probably wouldn't use that model, interpretable as it is, because it doesn't really get all of the essential features of the data generating process in question. Conversely, the models that you might use for raw prediction, machine learning models like you use for spam filtering, those models are far more opaque, far less easy to interpret. You oftentimes don't come up with anything very reasonable in terms of a nice punchline to give somebody. However, you get way better predictions. Even though you don't understand the process, you have it pinned down somewhere in a computer program. And likewise with poker. With poker, today I showed you the regression version of poker. Simple, interpretable, doesn't get the whole process pinned down. I could have showed you a very deep, difficult model of the simplest common poker game. Maybe it's like five card draw, right? I could have gotten that all the way right, and the results would have been so dense and so opaque that none of us would have been able to make any sense of them. All this to say, reality is oftentimes too complicated for us to pin it down, even with powerful tools, be they statistical or theoretical. It is therefore incumbent upon us to write down a model that's complicated enough for us to learn from it, but simple enough for us to be able to gain something from that learning process. And I hope that with that thought in mind, you can revisit this simple model of poker and say, hey, this is a model of nothing, and yet it's a model of a lot of things. So the humility that I advocate so often isn't just informational, it's also epistemological. Are we going to be able to write down capital T, capital M, the model that gets it all right? And even if we did, would we be able to understand its results? No. Probably not, not for any phenomena that's interesting enough to care about. Heck, it took forever just to get the sim simple model of poker that nobody would play because that game is way too boring. But to get that right took me an hour and a half. So when you read papers in your other classes, if they have a statistical model or a theoretical model, think to yourself, was this complicated enough for me to learn something, but simple enough for me to be able to say what I learned? And if so, then I think that that's a really outstanding balance of this Goldilocks problem of getting it all, but getting, en but getting little enough that we can understand it. I hope that that tension is beginning to make some sense to you because it's a very important, it's a, it's a very important lesson to learn as you are a political science major or some other social science major. How to balance these considerations is, is no easy task. Regardless, I apologize again for breaking down in the middle of the lecture, and I really am appreciative. Thanks for watching.